This episode was pre-recorded on August 18th to promote Mesquite ISD's new leadership and empowerment team, or LET. Through this podcast, you will hear firsthand how MISD works daily to provide equitable learning environments for all. Though our podcast episode was pre-recorded, we acknowledge that current issues and events, such as the August 23rd Jacob Blake shooting, are painful to our community and why these conversations are necessary. Welcome to episode two of Let's Talk, a podcast highlighting the work of MISD's new leadership and empowerment team, LET, or LET. My name is Ted Madden, and I work in the communications department. And I'm Daniel Norwood, social studies coordinator for the district. We established the leadership and empowerment team with the goal of knocking down any racial, cultural, or gender-related obstacles to ensure our students have the most equitable learning environments to become the leaders they want to be. Today, we're visiting with Mesquite High School librarian, Amy Ann Bailey. But before we begin, I think it's important we establish who we are so you can better understand our perspective and where we're coming from. I'm a 47-year-old white man. I'm a 38-year-old black man. And I am a 45-year-old white woman. And you're owning it. (laughs) And I'm owning it. (laughs) As I mentioned, Amy Ann is a librarian. And there are a lot of topics to discuss from that standpoint, but I want to start with your Facebook page because you're both very active and very outspoken. You know it's a bad idea to bring up controversial topics and politics on Facebook, right? So why are you doing it? I am very well aware. Um, I am doing it because I believe we all have a platform, um, very some big, some small, but we all have um, – a way to use our voices. And I believe that social media is one of those ways that we can reach people. Um, I've been speaking out again about social justice issues um, probably since 2016 when um, I've experienced some firsthand experiences through my students at Mesquite High School. And so I have um, been vocal on social media to the detriment of some relationships that I've had. Um, But I've also had so many people um, talk to me about how they appreciate that I'm using my voice, Um, not just people of color, but my my white friends also who are trying to become better allies. And so I just, anytime I get uncomfortable or I I start um, wanting to, to pull back, I think this is not about me. This is about the message, and I believe in it, and I believe that also um, in my beliefs as a Christian that it's about love and love for everyone. And so that is why um, I don't share everything I want to share on social media. I want to make that clear. I'm very um, purposeful as a librarian. Um, I check my sources. I do some self-reflection before I do post, but everything I post I do with true intent to try to add to the conversation. Now, Amy Ann, I know, you know, we, we go way back. Uh, just yes, we do, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> she was a teacher at West Mesquite when I was there. Um, I was Daniel's teacher. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, that's why it's good to establish the age difference. Yes. Exactly so right. Yes. Your age yes. So, it's, you know, so you could have been a teacher. Yes. Yeah, you have a speech. You prepared me for this moment. This All is right, pretty so, cool. So you mentioned the term allies uh, in your response there. And I know that one of the things that you've shared a lot on social media uh, and in our group uh, are are texts and pieces of literature that refer to uh, anti-racist. Can you tell us a little more what anti-racist means? Well, anti-racism or anti-racist is, um, it's, it's a buzzword right now because we hear, we hear, we've been hearing that in the past couple of months. Um, but it, when you, when you do the work, when you start the work of becoming an anti-racist, I think, um, you have to understand that it's a process and it never ends. It's not that you can just read one book and say, oh, I'm an anti-racist. Um, it is a very hard process that takes, it, it, like I said, it's, it's continual work. Um, and what I think that means is that you don't only stand against racism, but you stand against homophobia. homophobia. You stand against sexism. You stand against all of the isms that are in this world who um, that are dividing us. And so it's not just about race. It's about class. It's about gender. It's about sexuality. Because to be a true anti-racist means that there is equality for all, not just for some. And so... Um, 
digging into that work is is hard and um, there are levels to it, but it's essential because I think that mindset of an anti-racist is what we need to make this world a better place. You said 2016 is kind of when you began really um, jumping on board the, mm-hmm. the social justice issues and talking about it on social media. What got you started? Well, I think I think this has been brewing in my life for a while. Um, I have been a teacher in Mesquite ISD since 1998. I grew up in this community. I graduated from Mesquite High School. I'm a very proud par- um, part of this community. Um, but, you know, I, I have taught in um, schools that had majority students of color my whole career. And growing up in the 90s, um, the mindset was colorblindness. Um, it was, we don't see color. And I don't think that is, um, I, think, I think there's good intent behind that. I just think when you dig into that, that's, it's a problem because when you say I don't see color, that means that you are not seeing the true identity of a person and you are assigning kind of blankness to a person of color or maybe even assigning your white values. And, and, and that's that's not right. And so my students over the years have taught me that, that I would and I'll be honest, I would I wouldn't want to say a student is black. I, and I would even catch myself myself saying I don't mean to be racist, but that student is black. There is nothing, it is not racist to acknowledge someone's race. I just want to make that very clear. Um, I think that is a prevalent thought in our society is that if you see a black person and think, oh, they're black, you're being racist. No, no, no. The racism comes after that. When you see someone and say that person is black and then fill in stereotype after that. Um, so I've been struggling with my own colorblindness, um, for years and just feeling unsettled about it, but not really understanding. Um, I would start noticing that I was one of the only white people in a room when I was teaching. And I just thought, am I really doing my best for these kids? Because I'm coming at this from a middle-class white perspective and their experiences are very different from my experiences because my students would tell me stories and I would listen to them and I would honor them. And as an English teacher, especially, we would talk about very heavy topics. They would write about very heavy topics. And I just started seeing this dissonance, like things just weren't adding up. And I realized that just because it's not true for me doesn't mean it's not true for someone else. So all that to say, um, I was kind of coming into this and just feeling some discomfort. And then Uh, Of course, a kid rocked my world in 2016 because that's what kids do. Um, So I was uh, in the Mesquite High School Library, and I was trying to help a group of boys find books, and that's what I do. And um, I will never forget this day. It was February of 2016. A group of boys was sitting at a table. It was two Hispanic boys and two black boys. And I gave my spiel to this class. Let's go find books. Yay. And they just sat there. So I walked over to them. I said, okay, guys, let's go find some books. And they just looked at me and said, and the Hispanic boy said, Miss, reading is for white people. And I just froze. And I think maybe 10 years ago, I would have told him he was wrong and like pushed him away and, and not dug in. But something in that moment just made me stop and ask questions. And so I said, why do you think that? And then we just, we had a conversation and all of these boys went around the table and told me stereotypes of why they thought they weren't supposed to be readers. Um, One said, well, you know, miss, uh, you know, Mexicans just work in, work on the roof and mow yards. And then one of the black boys said, and you know, black people just hustle in the streets. And it was like they were reading from a script and And I was so angry, but I wasn't angry at them. I was angry at the world because these, this is what we've created for them. And they just saw their place. Like, this is your place. And so I said, you know what, guys, that's, that's not true. You're, these are stereotypes and, and reading is for all of us. And I'm going to help you find some books that reflect you. 
And I wish I could say they all found books that day and everything was happy. But of course, that's not the case. None of them checked out a book and they rolled their eyes at me. And um, but that that comment, it was like it changed everything for me. And it started me on this journey where I couldn't get that kid's voice out of my head. It made me reexamine everything I thought about reading, everything I was doing as a librarian, all the books in our library. And I've always considered myself a reader of diverse books. And um, I love young adult literature because it is real and raw. But um, I wanted to make sure my students were seeing their stories told um, from different perspectives and different ethnicities. So I, you know, I, I started looking at that. Um, and then um, in April of 2017 um, was the murder of Jordan Edwards, um, a freshman at Mesquite High School. Um, I did not know Jordan personally, but I know many students who, who did know him. Um, and that, that changed everything for us. It, I mean, we're not the same. And so walking through that with those kids, just baby see that we have to do better. So we started having some really hard conversations. And I just listened because that's all I know to do because I know I don't know what it's like to be black in this country. I read books about it and I try and I'm empathetic, but I don't know what it's like. And my students um, had some really hard things to talk about and they had proof that it wasn't safe to go to a party and just be a kid. If Jordan Jordan was not doing anything wrong, and it doesn't matter, even if he was, he shouldn't have been shot. So, we had read um, I had read the Hate You Give. Um, that year it had come out, and um, by Angie Thomas. I read it right when it came out. It was getting so much buzz, and I knew that book was going to change everything in publishing. And um, I read it, and then Jordan was murdered in the next few months. And I just, over the summer, I thought, we need to read this book. We, our kids need to read this book. This is the book that we need right now. I believe books can be therapeutic. I believe they can help us learn and just start conversations. And so um, I have the best faculty, or the best administration I went to them and said I want to I want to read this with kids and talk about it and they said yes and um that was a really brave decision because things were very raw and um I had student a student who was supposed to be in the car with Jordan that night um in fact he was supposed to go to the party he got grounded and didn't go he um he always rode, and I don't say the term shotgun anymore because I can't because of Jordan, but he rode in the front seat um, always with these boys, and he didn't that night. And so Jordan rode in the front seat. And so my student kept telling me it should have been me. If I had been there that night, I would be dead and not Jordan. And so these kids were going through Horrific things, horrific things that students should not have to go through. No one should have to go through that. We had to talk about it because our kids don't want to talk about hard things. They're scared. They, there's all kinds of issues with that. But when they find someone they trust, they will talk. And I felt very honored to be um, in that position with them. And so I just listened and, um, and we talked and then Something really cool happened. We got to um, we got to Skype with Angie Thomas, the author. Um, she has been amazing support of our students. I've reached out to her through social media, and she has been a just checking on our kids and um, in the ways that she can support them. She does, and so she offered to Skype with us um, for an hour, and so the book club got to talk to her. We had some really powerful conversations and um you know I wish I could say there's there is healing but it's a process and um you know Jordan would have graduated last year and so most of his friends graduated um last year was hard especially with the pandemic 
and shutting down school and not being able to experience the end of the school year with those kids who were still grieving Jordan and then realizing he wasn't there. And then that normalcy and those people who support them weren't with them. And so that was, that was a difficult, difficult thing. Um, so I'm not going to apologize for getting emotional about this because it is very emotional. Um, but I also know that my, um, my journey isn't based on emotion. Um, it is based on facts. It is based on research. Um, I have done a lot of reading and a lot of research, and I know for a fact that systemic racism exists. Um, it, is in, it is the smog in the air we breathe. And no matter how much we say we aren't racist, we have that tendency in us, especially as white people, and we have to identify it. We have to get uncomfortable with it. And every time I want to push it away, I see Jordan's face. And I think about my students, and I think about their stories, and I know that I have a part to play in this, and I I can do my part, and it's never going to end. And so I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be in a district that is willing to have the hard conversation and to um, do what's best for our kids. Amy Ann, and I, I know I used to call you Miss Bailey, but the <laughs> 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 the um, and and it's such a powerful story what what you're telling us mm-hmm. now. Just the last couple of years and and being able to witness that mm-hmm. uh, has been has been awesome. Um, and I know on our on our team uh, on the let committee, mm-hmm. uh, you've played a vital role in, in furthering our conversation mm-hmm. uh, and going into the tough places. Can you talk about just specifically? I know you've you've mentioned the book club, but what role does literature play, uh, especially young adult literature from you know from different authors? What does that play in, in breaking patterns of discrimination mm-hmm. uh, and bias? That is such a great question, and that is I'm going to try not to preach (laughs) because this is where I get really passionate. Um, But first of all, I believe books are empathy pills. Um, Books let us step into people's lives that we wouldn't normally get to step into and walk in their shoes and and just live a different experience. And so um, I think we can all agree we are severely lacking in empathy in our world right now. Um, And so... Books, period, just if someone can just step into that. I mean, there have been studies done that say people who read fiction are more empathetic, scientifically proven. Um, And so that is one reason I'm so passionate about getting our students to read, because I think it can help them be better humans. Um, But young adult literature is so powerful because there is a a researcher named um, Ruth Sims Bishop, And she talks about how books are either windows, mirrors, or sliding glass doors. And and I think this can apply to every age level, not just kids or teens. Um, But we need books to be mirrors first to reflect our own lives and our own experience. And um, in children's literature, especially over the years, there's been a real problem with the lack of representation. And um, so most characters were white or animals. And so I think a lot of the problem with our kids is they didn't see themselves reflected in books. And I think that was a lot of the problem with the young men I spoke with. Um, So we need books to be those mirrors, but we also need them to be windows. And um, I think that's where that stepping into another experience that's not your own. Um, There's a huge surge in young adult literature right now of books uh, for all types of ethnicities um, and people of color. And it's not just social justice books. Those are important, but not every kid, not every black kid is going to have that, um, you know, that interaction with the police. I think those are important because it exists, but we just need books that reflect, they call it black boy joy and black girl magic. And, you know, our Latin, our Latinx students and just every, just live in life because that's what kids do. And they just know that they can just go out there and live their lives and their stories matter. They matter so much they're going to show up on a page. That's, that's so important. But also sliding glass doors because you can step in and out of an experience. Um, and I'm just going to say as a mom, um, I have two teenage daughters and um, 
I push my girls who are both, you know, white, middle class. I push them to read diverse texts because I want them. They have diverse friends, but I want them to just have that different level of experience because I feel like as a parent, that is my job is to teach them that empathy and not just model it in myself, but show them other perspectives. The world is not just your white perspective. There's a, it's everyone's. So I think um, reading and especially reading diverse books is the best thing you can do to open, open your eyes to what's, what the world is really like. So how has the Mesquite High School Library tangibly changed over the last few years? Well, you know, we're always changing. That's what we do in libraries. Um, people, people, <laughs> you know, we do this because this is a human thing. We, we attach what we knew in the past or our experiences onto what we think something is now. So, for example, I, I have friends who when I started – um, became a librarian were sad because they thought I was just going to be stuck in a room with books and not have interaction with kids and not teach anymore. And that's, that's the least, I mean, that's not even true. I have more interaction with students than I ever did. Um, and so we're constantly changing um, and we're constantly looking at what's going on not only the needs of our campuses, but the needs of our kids in our world and, and trying to meet that need. So we were already doing a great job, but we are just really working on offering diverse books to our kids and, and teaching them how to choose a book. Um, in high school, our students come with a lot of layers of jadedness about reading. Either they don't like it, they liked it at one point, they just have a lot of things are competing for their attention. They've been told they're not good at it. They've been forced to read boring books through curriculum. Um, and so there's just a lot of different layers we have to peel away. Um, one thing I do want to say is that we are doing a really great job in our district of letting kids choose what they, they want to read and honoring that choice and not sticking to the canon. Um, my thought is students will naturally find the books that they need to read, the classics, if that's what they need to read. But I think if we all reflect on our own reading lives, being forced to read a classic probably did more detriment to our reading um, our reading lives than it did good. Yep. And I know a lot of adults who won't read or they think it's boring because of the books they were forced to read in high school. So th- one reason I got out of the English classroom is I couldn't make my kids read Old Man in the Sea one more year. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that book, and I was tired of faking it. Um, and so I felt like I could do I could do more in the library of um, helping kids find their love of it because that's what we need. We need um, citizens who are going to seek out true facts. Facts still exist, and um, we have to seek them out. But then also um, – like I said, grow, grow in empathy. And I think books can do that. I guess the question, the question now is maybe for the adults, uh, because we've talked a lot about the youth and the Mm -hmm. the literature that's Mm -hmm. out there. But, you know, if I'm a teacher or I'm a parent or somebody else in the community who says, Hey, what, you know, what, where can I start Mm -hmm. to find more information on, on what you're talking about? Where where do we start? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, we are, as our committee, um, and not just people on this committee, but librarians and teachers in the district and people who who have been on this journey. I call it a journey because it is. Um, we are coming together and we are curating a list of resources for our community. Um, and they are going to be all different categories. Um, there are the you know, the books that came out on all the lists in June after George Floyd's murder, um, there were some amazing anti-racism lists put out there, but it was, it, it was a little overwhelming. It was, here, here's every book you can read on systemic racism, and it almost felt like it was, um, it's too much. And especially if you haven't delved into that topic yet, you don't even know where to start. So our mindset is to give a few choices in each category with the intention to keep producing the list so that it's not just, oh, reactionary, you know. Um, And we just have to acknowledge that this this has been happening in cycles. I think 
what happened with George Floyd with his murder in June is we in in our world we are we are paying a little more attention. I think we're being a little more still. Um, but if you look at this happened to um, Michael Brown, this happened to Philander Castile. Um, so these things have been happening, but I there's something different about George Floyd. Um, so I, I love that all those lists were being produced, but notice you haven't seen a lot lately, and that bothers me. So one intent that we want to have with our, our resources that we're going to give to our community, especially our staff in Mesquite ISD, is here's a few choices. Make a commitment to read one, and there's all kinds of, you know, young adult book, middle grade, podcast, um, video, movie. So it's not just a book. So if, if you are book adverse, we'll get you, but, you know, we'll, we'll tiptoe you in. And then in a couple, you know, in a couple of months, we'll put out a new list. And then we ask you to pick up some other resources. So I think that's a continual it's good to have continual education. Like I said, this is not just a one and done, um, but it also can be very overwhelming. But my message to adults is you have to start. It's uncomfortable and it's not fun, but if you're tired of the way the world is, the only way out is through. It's just going to keep happening. So if, if you really want to change the cycle, then you have to do the work yourself. The work starts with you. It is not up to our, our friends of color to teach us. We cannot put that burden on um, on our, you know, our black friends. Oh, I have a black friend. Let me talk to them. Let me. It's not their job to, to speak for the whole race. Um, so as whites, as white people, we need to take that burden on ourselves and really sit and examine our part because we all have a part to play. That's Amy Ann Bailey, librarian over at Mesquite High School. Thanks for the work you do and the passion you bring to your work. Thank you. Next week, we'll visit with the district's personnel director, Mary Randall, who has been with the district for a long time and has good historical perspective on how much more diverse MISD has become over the years. For Daniel Norwood, I'm Ted Madden. Let's talk again next week.